Okay, I'm going to just spend a little bit of time carrying on with um, what we've been talking about. Now, just a little recap um, for those who haven't been here. We've, been, we've had Easter, we've had Ascension Sunday, and we've had Pentecost Sunday. And now we're into this period post-Pentecost. And the reason we're carrying on thinking about the, the church, and that's what we're doing, we're looking at the early church, the, the, the accounts in Acts um, of the early church, is because, remember, we did that ser sermon series on I Speak, uh, I Speak Jesus. Yeah, looking at the life of Jesus, looking at the way that he demonstrated things of the kingdom in the world, and that we learn what the kingdom of God looks like by looking at Jesus, by looking at the way he interacted with people, by looking at the way he welcomed people, by looking at the way he transformed people's lives. And this bit is, is, is a continuation of that, really, but it's looking at the church who continue to do this work of Jesus. So now, together, we look like Jesus. We carry on this work of the kingdom, and we're called to demonstrate the things of the kingdom in the world. So it's a continuation. So Jesus came, demonstrated it, called his disciples around him, ascended to heaven, and remember that phrase, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You will wit be witnesses to what I am about. You will be witnesses to the things of the kingdom of God. And then, before you go and do that, go wait in the city, and I will pour out my spirit on you. So, you will be my witnesses, and I will give you the power and the equipping to be able to do that. So, as we go through these next few weeks, what we're looking at is what does that look like for the church? As we look at the Acts church, what do we learn about what it means to look like Jesus, to be his body together? So I'm going to read from Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. Very familiar um, passage, I'm sure, for many of us. Um, but we're going to look at this today and just learn a couple of things from it and just ask a couple of things from it. Acts 2, verses 42 to 47. They devoted themselves, this is the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And then a short bit from Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 35. Acts 4, 32 to 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distrib distributed to anyone who had need. So we're looking at this passage. We're looking at how the early church demonstrated the things of the kingdom. Remember that phrase, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You and me will be his witnesses in the world. This is the calling of the church. Our church, the church in Sheffield, the church across the UK, the church across the world are called to be the witnesses to the kingdom of God, to the things of Jesus. This is what we're called to be. He does it collectively through us. He was one person through whom the kingdom of God was demonstrated. Now we are his body. And he brings together people from different backgrounds, different races, different social economic backgrounds, uh, different, interna different um, nations. He brings them together. He brings us together. Together, we bring the things that ne are needed to make up the body of Christ. 
That's why we need each other. That's why we depend on each other. Different people come with different gifts. Now, Pentecost. What would you expect to happen after Pentecost? Zach did a talk on Pentecost a couple of weeks ago. And we talked about the fire that came on the people of God. The equipping that came on the people of God. An amazing story as they waited in the city and God poured out his spirit on his people. I remember then, then Peter stood up and preached, didn't he, under the power of the spirit. And many people came to, to know Jesus. It was, it was by all means a, 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 a multi um, experience, you know, a bit an experience in all dimensions. You know, there was, there was flames of fire on people's heads. They were speaking in all different languages. It must have been an amazing thing to be part of, to see. What would you expect to happen off the back of that? Maybe you'd say, well, then they go out and they tell lots of people. Well, we know that Peter did preach, but what was the first fruit of Pentecost? The first fruit of Pentecost was this. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. And people were added to their number as they did this. That was the initial fruit, the first fruit of the Pentecost. It was channeled into tangible communities living and loving one another. And the fruit was that into those communities, people were attracted. People were, I want in on that. Because what they saw was the things of the kingdom being demonstrated. And that's what we're thinking about this morning. What does it look like for the people of God to be a tangible demonstration of the kingdom? Of the values of the kingdom of God? So that people look at it and go, I want in on that. I want to see the fullness of that. I want to experience what that is. I want to be in community. I want to see miracles happen. I want to see there be no need in the community where no one has need, where where what people have is shared with people so that everyone is able to live life well. If that's what people see, they'll want in on that. And that's what they saw in the early church. They, the people of God in their communities carry on the work. So together we are the body. Together we look like Jesus. Just a brief word on together we are the body. You remember in 1 Corinthians 12 it says this. Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. All the different gifts, these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body. Whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body, each one of us then bringing something different to benefit the body, each with different gifts and skills. This is the work of the Spirit to bring us together. And I've said this before, you would never find the the mix of people that you do find in churches than you would do if they weren't coming around Jesus. It's such a range of people, the people that you meet. And as you travel, as you go around the world and you you see God's church in action, you, you get to meet people that you would never meet apart from the fact that we are focused on Jesus. We're seeking him. By his spirit, he brings his body, his church together. And it's one of the joys of traveling, if you have the privilege of traveling and going to different churches around the world, that you step into a place and you have this in common with people that you've never met before who are seeking Jesus just as you are. And it's a beautiful thing when, you, when that happens. He brings us together as one body. Yesterday, um, the community that I'm part of, we went to help someone um, uh, tidy up their house. They've just moved into a house, and we helped them tidy. And there were diff- it, very practically, there were lots of different skills there. I mean, I wasn't going to be the person who was going to put up the cupboard in the downstairs toilet. That would not have been a good blessing to this person. 
Um, those aren't my skills particularly. I can do it, but it's not particularly my skill. Someone else was there who did that. Um, some people were there to help with gardening because that's what they like to do. Some people were there to help, you know, we make tea, make coffee, make, help there be a sense of community there. All coming with different gifts and skills. Some were painting. Uh, again, not my skill. <laughs> I was in the garden. I'm good at chopping things. You know, I get a, a hedge trimmer and I just chop things. It's quite, quite, quite rough and raw, but, you know, it gets the job done. But the point being that we came with different gifts. And that's a practical outworking, isn't it? But within our, within our community as well, we have people from, I think, five different nationalities now. And we have people who come with a more, more prophetic sense, and they'll bring a sense of what God is saying. Uh, we have people who are more teachers, and they'll bring a sense of that into the... And together, together, there's, this, there's this, these different gifts and different skills that bring something of depth and wealth to the community. And it's true of many of our communities in this church, that that's what God does. He brings together people uh, on our own. We, we can't do it. Together, we look like Jesus. Together, we bring the different gifts, the different skills, spiritual gifts, practical gifts. This is God's way. This is how he carries on his work in the world. Together, we look like Jesus. And as we do this, as we come together as the people of God, we carry on. Remember the Isaiah mandate of Jesus when in, in Luke it talks about him standing up in the temple and saying, um, that he stood up and he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he did this then, didn't he? Once he denounced that, he did it. He preached good news. He brought release to those who were prisoners of ill health. He brought release to those who were constrained by societal structures but that meant they weren't able to live full lives. He healed people, the blind man, the woman bleeding. And these people were then able to live better lives and fuller lives because of what he did. Because of this healing, because of this inclusion that he gave to them. Because he was demonstrating the things of the kingdom. The kingdom of God broke in through his ministry. One way of understanding the kingdom of God that I've been... I found very helpful in recent times. I, I, I can't avoid talking about thing, things I've done and places I've been. The team joke all the time. They've got like this little bingo card, I think, which says Mike's going to mention he's been to Israel or he's been... Well, okay, I, I can't help it. I'm going to say it. Get your bingo cards out, team. It's fine. Last week, I was in Rwanda. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I was with Tearfund. I had the privilege of going to Rwanda with Tearfund to see the work of God in his church in Rwanda. It's amazing, and, and I'm sure I will be saying more things as the weeks go on of, of this. But um, I, one of the things that Tearfund talk about is poverty, and, uh, and their understanding of poverty has really helped me understand what it means, what the kingdom of God is about. They talk about poverty being anything where people are lacking. We often think of poverty, don't we, as being an economic thing, a poor, a, a being poor uh, money-wise in, in terms of our income. But poverty is, is any area where people are lacking in their understanding. It can be economic, of course it can be economic, but it's also relational poverty. Relational poverty with other people. We talked about that this morning with, with red frogs, the loneliness that people experience. And it's, a, it's an epidemic in our society, loneliness. It's not just amongst students, it's amongst people. And you can, be, you can be in a room with lots of people but feel incredibly lonely. And that is a poverty. And there's a, there's a poverty spiritually where relationship with God, where people have a lack of that understanding of who God is and who they are in God. And I love this understanding of poverty. This, they call it the three pillars of poverty uh, in Tear Fund. Which, which is, and that's what the kingdom of God goes against. That's what the kingdom of God challenges. In heaven there is no poverty. In heaven, there is no p need. People don't have need. People don't go hungry. In heaven, people don't have a lack of relationship with each other. They don't have a lack of community. In heaven, there is no lack of relationship with God. And so when we pray, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven, we are praying for the breaking of those poverty, that poverty on all three strands on earth now as it is in heaven and will one day be fully realized. So we as the church of God 
are called to demonstrate those things of the heaven of heaven now to go after those things those those the poverty that there is in the world on those levels and i i found that really helpful that understanding of poverty to understand what it's all about think about jesus's ministry the physical healings that he did were demonstrations of the kingdom of god in themselves but then they led to the alleviation of poverty in these people's lives on other levels, didn't they? This is the thing. It's holistic. It's not one or the other. How big is your gospel is a good question to ask. Sometimes you'll find churches that will talk about the gospel on one strand. Like it's about making people followers of Jesus and getting their relationship with right with God. We are absolutely about that. But sometimes you'll get people who talk about, well, it's, it's about the alleviation of um, material poverty. We're absolutely about that. But we're not going to go after one thing or the other. We believe in the full gospel of God. That in heaven there is no poverty on all those three levels. So we will go after all of them. And actually, we're the poorer if we just focus on one rather than the other. The richness of the gospel, the richness of the kingdom of God is going after all. The fullness of it. So think about those people in, that Jesus demonstrated the kingdom of God to. The woman healed, healed of bleeding was one I thought about. She was physically healed. That was a miracle. We believe in miracles. We believe in praying for God to heal people. But look what that led to for her. It led to her being able to be a part of society again, where she had to stay outside of society. It led to her inclusion into society. It led to her then being able to, I'm sure, although we're not told this definitely, but I'm pretty certain, will le led to her being able to earn a living again, to be economically viable again, to have a standard of life that she deserved, whereas before she would have been ex ex excluded from society because of that physical element. Do you see how the, the, it's, it all joins together? You go after one thing and you meet another thing. The healing of the leper in Matthew 8. Jesus said to the leper, didn't he, when he healed him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Why did he do that? Why did Jesus tell him to go to the priest? Because the priest was the one who could say to, the, to him, you are clean. You can now participate. You can now be included in society again. You can come and worship at the temple. So the poverty of, of relationship with God met in his healing. The poverty of relationship with other people met through his healing. Do you see how it all works together? And as we go after them together, it can work the other way as well. I was thinking about Zacchaeus. We talked about Zacchaeus recently. Not particularly liked because he was a tax collector and he was probably creaming off the top of the tax, adding a bit to it, to, the, to his fellow Jews so that he could become rich. And understandably, he was not a, um, a liked person in his society. But Jesus invites him in and he probably didn't have a lot of friends because of the way he was, but Jesus chooses to give him relationship. Jesus chooses to invite him in and actually says, I'll come to your house and I'll eat with you. And all the people, the Jewish people, a lot of them chuntering, why on earth is he doing this? Why is he giving relational equity, if you like, to this person? But look what happened when he did that, when he met that aspect of poverty, if you like, in Zacchaeus' life. Salvation came to that house and he stood up and said, I, today I'm going to give back what I've taken. The disparity of rich and poor begins to be addressed through what Zacchaeus is doing. And the fullness of the gospel is demonstrated, both relational and physical. And we're not told whether Zacchaeus becomes a follower of Jesus. But I would hasten to, I, I would again be very tempted to, to, to believe he did after what happened to him. So again, that's, an, that's a flowing of going after one aspect of poverty into another. The woman caught in adultery, the relational power imbalance of a group of people pointing the finger at her and her sin, a group of men pointing the finger at her and her sin. And Jesus deals with this by saying, who of you here is without sin? He points out the hypocrisy. 
He deals with the relational power imbalance in the situation. And then he deals with the poverty spiritually, the spiritual poverty, by saying, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Do you see how it all works together, the different aspects of poverty in a person's life? And this is what we are called to. This is what we're called to go after. This is the fullness of the gospel. It's holistic. It cannot be separated into separate bits. You can't separate the gospel into spiritual and physical. Jesus never did that. He went after them together because they all had a bearing on each other. And the followers of Jesus together carried on this work. There being, being signs of the kingdom, demonstrations of what the kingdom looked like. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. So they were going after the spiritual dimension. To each other, the relational dimension. And they shared with each other what each other had and gave according to need. The material poverty, they dealt with that. In that section, in that few verses about the early church, you see them going after all three areas of poverty. The purpose of the church is to be a demonstration of the kingdom of these values. This is the fruit of Pentecost. Communities that look like this. Churches that look like this. That go after the fullness of the gospel. That demonstrate the fullness of the gospel in our lives so that people look to it and go, we want in on that. That looks like a good thing. That's what we want to be part of. This is the fruit of the outpouring of the Spirit. I'm going to finish just with a couple of, a couple of an example from when I was in Rwanda uh, of the work of the church there. Um, I, like I say, I had the privilege last week to travel there with Tiff, and it, it came out of the blue. You'll remember that every third Sunday we've been having people coming and speaking to the church about their particular area. And we've had Tiff, and we've had open doors. Well, when Tiff came, Pete Dawson, he said to me after it, "Do you fancy coming on a trip to?" Um, to, to, to Rwanda with Tiff, and of course I said yes, you know. But this was February, and suddenly I find myself last week in Rwanda visiting the church. I didn't have any time to think about it, and to be honest with you, it was very overwhelming in a good way. It was the, the sense of the presence of God in these places, in these churches. And we went there to learn. It wasn't about us going with something. We went there to learn, and every church we went to, we said, we're here to learn from you, to see what God is doing in your church. And I just want to share with you a couple of stories, uh, well, one story, one church. You can see pictures there of, of this church, and I'll just explain what they are. So this church um, was in a very rural bit. We had to go over some very rough roads, um, even worse than Sheffield's roads, um, to get to this church. Um, and... The pastor there was so proud to take us around. And what I emphasize is this is what the church had done. This, is what, this isn't Tiffin going and doing stuff for people and going away. The, we were going there to kind of, Tiffin go there to bless what was going to encourage, to say, look at what you're doing. You're doing a great thing. Look at what God is doing through you. And um, so here you see that car. That's actually a car that um, people learn to drive in at the church. Now the pastor said, um, to the driving school, which is in the city. If you come to my church, we'll create a space for you where people can learn to drive. You, and I'll make sure there's lots of people in my community who can come and learn to drive. And we'll make sure that's make that possible for them. So, it, I mean, it, it was a really rough, muddy uh, area where they were learning to drive. I don't know how you learn to drive in that area. But anyway, that's, that's what happened. And we actually saw three lads who were just about to take their driving test now, why is that important? Because in this rural community, you cannot go and earn money unless you can get to the city and get a decent job. You can earn money, but for, for many of them who wanted to be able to go and get a decent job, they need transport. So what they're doing is they're giving them the means to be able to do that. So the church does that. It, it enables these people within their local community to take driving tests, to learn how to drive, motorbikes are the big thing they go on uh, everywhere it's crazy um, but um, they learn to drive and then they're able to be able to um, earn money that picture the bit the larger picture of the ladies they're, they're all there with their children what they did is they the church bought sewing machines and 
these la- gave the, the, these ladies a means to be able to make clothes so they could sell them again so that they can bring uh, money into their and they can be self-supporting and they can bring money to support their families and they provided a room just at the back where they would look after the children many of them had their children in little um, slings uh, to the uh, at the back of them they were just happily sleeping to the humming of this of the sewing machines um, but they were looking after the children in the room behind again giving them a means to be able to earn money get out of poverty in that in that respect now that's good in itself but as they are drawing people into these groups these people they also do bible study with them and we said to them do people want to do bible study you know isn't that a bit weird just saying we'll do bible study with them straight away and um, they said no because they see the fruit of what this church is doing in our community and they, they see the salt and light was the phrase they used and we want to be part they want to be part of that and they want to learn why that is what the church is doing and so these people get invited in to what they call self-help groups, and then they do Bible study together. And they, they've gone from, in 2015, the church had 144, 45 people. Now in 2024, it's got 620 people in the church. So these people are, are being met at all areas of the, of, of the poverty, if you like, of those three areas of poverty. That last picture is a baptism pool. Um, it actually is quite scary how deep it is. It's like more like a drowning pool to me. I was like, you can't <laughs> fill that up. To but I mean, who wouldn't want to get baptized with that view behind as well? But I just put that there to say, as they are going after these things, people are coming to faith. This is the holistic gospel. Now, I know this is a different culture. I know as we talk about the UK, there's different needs. But there is something about the fullness of the gospel going after the fullness of the gospel and it being joined up, not one or the other, that draws people out of these three areas of poverty. They've seen 350 people baptized since 2015. And I heard story after story of poverty being addressed on all these levels. And as I say, I know the UK is a different context and one of the, some of the work that I'm thinking about and really trying to wrestle with is what does it look like in our context? But I think there are things that I want to learn from what I've seen in terms of what we go after as a church. And I think we're already doing it in many respects. But this is what I want us to be about. I want us to be about the church that represents the fullness of the gospel. And as we do that, I'm sure we will see people come and say, I want in on that. I want part of that. And actually, we do see that already. But we don't just want little bits. I'd love to see this fullness of it. And lots of people coming to know Jesus, just as this um, church has seen. Spiritually, relationally, materially. Relationally with God, relationally with each other. Relieving poverty physically, materially. Relieving poverty spiritually with God. John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You and I are not called to be mildly interested. We're called to be devoted. And I want to just leave us with that word, devoted. If you just put that slide up, please, Dom. Dom, you just put that last slide up. Thank you. I want us to go away and just ask the question, ask God, what does it mean for you to be devoted? Because that's what it says in that passage. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to each other, to the breaking of bread. And many were added to their number as they did this. There was no one who had need. And it takes a choice. It takes a decision I'm going to read something that John Tyson, who's a preacher in New York City, wrote, which I found very challenging. He, this is a parody of the Acts passage that we've read. Acts 2, 42 to 47. This is a parody of it. They studied the apostles' teaching when they had time. They went to fellowship when they could fit it in. They prayed when they needed something and got coffee together every now and then. They were content without and had a low expectation for signs and wonders in their midst. 
They sometimes talked about generosity but kept all of their possessions for themselves. Two out of five Sundays they came to corporate gatherings. They didn't invite people into their homes and rarely revealed their hearts. They were largely irrelevant to all the people and occasionally someone was randomly saved. I find that very challenging. So can I call you to a life of devotion, as we've read in the early church, to God, to his body on earth, his church, that we may be a credible, tangible demonstration of the kingdom of God. We'll know we're on the right track when we see these different aspects of poverty being addressed. We already do see those things. I think there's more. The lack being dealt with, it isn't one or the other, it's the full gospel And it's realized through Jesus' body here on earth now. You and me and the millions of other communities of Christians around the world. Hudson Taylor said, devotion to God is still a voluntary thing. Hence the differences of attainment amongst Christians. What would it mean for you and I, for our church, to be devoted to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer? What does it look like for you? What does it look like for me? What are you doing that you need to keep doing? And what could you choose to stop to give space for you to be devoted in these areas? What could you commit to doing? Let's just have a moment of quiet. As always, this is not a, this should never ever be a done out of a sense of guilt. It should be done out of a sense of what is the Spirit of God saying to me? Where is he encouraging me? Where is he challenging me? And we just, I just encourage you to be open and honest with what the Spirit of God might be wanting to say. So just give a moment of quiet for us to listen to the Spirit speaking to each one of us. So, Father God, thank you for your word. And we simply pray, Lord, help us to follow you. Help us to be obedient to you. Holy Spirit, where you are speaking to us, I pray that you would help each one of us to remember and to act upon what you're saying. Lord, thank you that you call us as your church to be a demonstration of your kingdom on earth. Would you keep showing us what that looks like? Thank you that you choose us. And in your mercy, as broken people, you do something amazing through us. Lord, would you form your church? Would you build your church? Holy Spirit, would you work in us and through us so that we may not all not also not only be blessed but we may also be a blessing amen